More than four decades after launch, the Voyager 2 spacecraft continues to work even in the harshest possible conditions of deep space. Despite being billions of miles away, the resilient spacecraft continues to relay back fascinating and even alarming discoveries to mission controllers on Earth. When Voyager 2 passed the edge of our solar system, one of those findings was a massive wall of fire. What happens at this boundary and how do these occurrences affect us on Earth? Join us as we explore Voyager 2's discovery of a wall of fire on the outside of our solar system. What has allowed the Voyager 2 spacecraft to continue as long as it has and remain in contact with Earth is the arrays of sensors and transmitters, which are useless without a power source and would have stopped returning signals many years back if the power source had run out. The Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft are not powered by solar, which would be impossible given their distance from the Sun, but rather by radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTG. Each of the Voyager probes has three RTGs and they run on plutonium-238 as fuel. As the isotope decays, heat is produced, which is converted to electrical energy. The Voyager's launched generated 470 watts at 30 volts DC, but that has decreased with time, and it is not just the fuel that has declined. The thermocouples employed in the system have also deteriorated over time. The Voyagers were producing just under 270 watts each in 2011, about 76% of power at the start of the mission. But the spacecraft has an extra source of power on board that is also crucial to its operation. They have small thrusters, which then allow them to be repositioned to face the Earth for communication when necessary. And these thrusters have a tank of hydrogen fuel that they draw from. Even if they only work in bursts, they will eventually run out. One interesting feature of the thrusters is that they have a backup. After 37 years, the main thrusters were no longer working effectively, so NASA switched to the backup thrusters, which had not worked in nearly 40 years, and they worked flawlessly. Deep in the darkness of space, beyond the range of even sunlight, a significant advancement in space exploration has been made with Voyager 2. This entry into interstellar space which took place 119 astronomical units from the Sun, made it the second spacecraft to do so in history. The distance between the Sun and Earth, which is 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers, is one astronomical unit. The Voyager 1 went into interstellar space years before the Voyager 2 because it took fewer detours. The former made flybys of Uranus and Neptune, but Voyager 2 was the first spacecraft to directly sample the electrically charged hazes or plasmas that cover interstellar space and the solar system's distant outskirts. Voyager 2 is able to analyze solar winds, the composition and behavior of plasma particles, the interaction of cosmic rays, the structure and direction of magnetic fields, and other characteristics that define the solar system's boundaries. Scientists are still publishing studies based on the data delivered by Voyager 2 when it left the solar system. The crossing into interstellar space by Voyager 2 has helped us learn a lot about the solar system's edge while also revealing us completely new stuff. The event has also called into question several previously held beliefs regarding boundaries. Nevertheless, in order to properly interpret Voyager 2's recent results, it is necessary to first understand how the Sun works. Contrary to popular belief, the Sun is not a quietly burning ball that provides illumination, but rather a roaring nuclear furnace that speeds across the galaxy at approximately 450,000 miles per hour as it orbits the galactic center. Of course, because of the vast scale of the solar system, you may not feel high speed, but aside from the speed and enormous heat, the Sun is a constant source of magnetic fields allowing its surface to constantly throw off a wind of electrically charged particles known as the solar wind. This gust expands out in all directions, bringing the sun's magnetic field with it. Eventually, the solar wind collides with the interstellar medium, which contains debris from old star explosions. The solar wind and the interstellar medium, like oil and water, do not perfectly mix causing the solar wind to create a bubble within the interstellar medium known as the heliosphere. As per data from two voyages, this bubble extends about 11 billion miles from the Sun at its leading edge, 
enveloping the Sun, all eight planets, and much of the outer objects orbiting our star. However, the heliosphere works as a shield, protecting everything within it from most of the galaxy's high intensity radiation, and without it, your DNA would have been messed with. The heliosphere does have an outer boundary known as the heliopause, which is where interstellar space begins. What does this boundary look like? Knowing this can help us visualize our sun's journey through the galaxy and will also tell us more about the conditions of other stars distributed around the galaxy. For such reasons, the scientists were ecstatic as Voyager 2 approached the boundary. However, because several instruments on Voyager 1 ceased operating before crossing the boundary, there was no way to trace its trip during that transition phase. With the crossing of Voyager 2 in 2018, researchers could now examine what happens to an object as it approaches the heliopause for the first time. They found that the plasma encircling the spacecraft slowed, heated up, and became denser as it approached the boundary. But once there, the interstellar medium became far hotter, roughly 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the scientists could have anticipated. If you're wondering how Voyager 2 survived the heat, it's because the plasma was incredibly thin and diffuse, keeping the average temperature around the Voyager probes extremely low. Voyager 2 also validated a hypothesis that the heliopause is a leaking border, with leaks going both ways. Before passing through the heliopause, Voyager 1 flew through tendrils of interstellar particles that had pierced the heliopause like tree roots through rock. However, Voyager 2 encountered a stream of low energy particles that stretched more than 100 million miles further than the heliopause. Another enigma emerged as Voyager 1 approached the heliopause, entering a limbo-like region where the outgoing solar wind slowed to a crawl before crossing the heliopause. Voyager 2 observed solar wind from a completely distinct layer that was almost the same width as the static layer observed by Voyager 1. Voyager has consistently demonstrated that the Sun's effect extends beyond the solar system. The Sun is constantly firing forth shock waves of plasma known as coronal mass ejections or CMEs. They do participate in shaping the rest of the solar system, but Voyager 2's data showed how CMEs propagate beyond the heliopause and have the effect of reducing the number of cosmic rays beyond the bubble, which is somewhat compatible to what you might find out in the galaxy. Supernovas send shock waves out in the galaxy as well, stirring the interstellar medium, though not as strongly as CMEs. When we consider the possibility for cosmic rays to cause biological mutations in life on Earth, Voyager 2 shows that the Sun may have an impact on the possible evolution of life on distant worlds in this planetary system and elsewhere. Solving interstellar space mysteries necessitates a greater understanding of the heliosphere. Voyager 1 exited along the leading edge of the heliosphere, where it collides with the interstellar medium, while Voyager 2 exited along its left flank. We don't know the general shape of the heliosphere because there is no data on its wake. For all we know, the interstellar medium's pressure may keep the heliosphere fairly spherical, have a comet-like tail, or be shaped like a croissant. NASA outfitted each of the voyages with three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, mounted at the end of a boom. RTGs are one of the most basic forms of nuclear power, consisting of a brick of radioactive material surrounded by layers of thermal couples that use the temperature difference between the hot radioactive brick and the cold space to produce electrical power. The RTG units aboard Voyager 1 and 2 are powered by plutonium-238, this isotope of plutonium decays only by producing alpha particles, which are absorbed within the RTG and thus do not irradiate the other electronics in the spacecraft. As the plutonium decays over time, the amount of power produced decreases and the brick gradually cools. And as the brick cools, the efficiency of the thermoelectric generator decreases. Because plutonium-238 has an 87.7 year half-life, the spacecraft's power supply would be reduced by 0.787% per year. However, due to the declining efficiency of the thermocouples and the progressive degradation of various electrical components in the spacecraft, the total electrical power available has declined somewhat rapidly than that. In fact, after 23 years in space, the spacecraft's power systems were only producing roughly 67% of what they were during launch. To save energy, Voyager 2's instruments were switched to low power mode. 
Three of the four spacecraft launched beyond the solar system in the 1970s, Voyager 1 and 2 and Pioneer 11, were all heading in the direction of the solar apex, which meant they were following the apparent path of the Sun's travel in the Milky Way galaxy. To save more energy, in November of 1998, NASA permanently turned off non-essential instruments, leaving seven instruments operational. This was 21 years after launch, and through the turn of the century, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory JPL, continued to receive ultraviolet and particle fields data. For example, an enormous shockwave that had blasted out of the outer heliosphere in July of 2000 finally reached Voyager 2 in January of 2001. The shockwave had blitzed through the solar wind for six months, sucking up and accelerating charged particles. Voyager 2 returned significant data on the high-energy shock supercharged ion. In August of 2007, Voyager 2 went through the termination shock and entered the helio sheath. By November of 2017, the spacecraft had reached 116.167 AU, which is approximately 10.8 billion miles, or 17.378 billion kilometers from Earth, and was moving at a speed of 9.6 miles per second, or 15.4 kilometers per second relative to the Sun in the direction of the constellation Telescopium. On November 5, 2018, Voyager 2 crossed the heliopause, which is the boundary where solar wind influence ends. From that point on, Voyager 2 was in what is known as interstellar medium or space. Voyager 1 had crossed it years before despite controversy, but at this point, Voyager 2's plasma instrument detected the leap in particle density as protons, electrons and other charged particles struck the instrument. It also measured temperatures ranging from 30,000 to 50,000 Kelvin. Voyager 2 successfully fired up its trajectory correction maneuver thrusters on July 8, 2019, and will use them to adjust the spacecraft's direction for the foreseeable future. Voyager 2 last used those thrusters during its encounter with Neptune in 1989. The spacecraft's aging control thrusters have degraded, requiring them to fire an increasing and unsustainable number of pulses to maintain its antenna aimed at Earth. Mission engineers had to implement a new plan to make sure that both vintage spacecrafts continue to return the most accurate scientific data from the furthest reaches of space, making difficult decisions, notably about which instruments to keep running. The spacecraft is billions of kilometers away, and data from it takes over 17 hours to reach us. However, Voyager 2 is still going strong. Let us know in the comments section what you think of the ongoing Voyager mission.